welcome to the inaugural Squashing the Markets podcast with Bill Ullman. That's me. And I'm very pleased to have my first guest here today with me named Ron Suber. Ron has enjoyed a storied career on Wall Street. He is considered the quote unquote godfather of fintech by many and has had a great run as an executive and as an investor in financial technology companies. So welcome, Ron. Bill, great to see you here in New York at the worldwide headquarters. So first of all, fintech means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Maybe we could just set the table by you describing what you think fintech is and how to define it. That's a great question, and it's one that's asked by many people around the world. They don't want to know just what is it, but like when did it start and why did it start and so what? What's next? So really, fintech is the combination of finance companies and tech companies. I would argue that every company needs to be a fintech company, whether you're an incumbent bank or insurance company, you need to have that combination of finance and technology for this next generation. We call them the I generation who've always had an iPhone and the internet. They want this. So fintech really started 25 years ago, maybe 30 years ago, when E-Trade and E-Loan and PayPal and Square came aboard, bringing technology to the finance world, making us able to trade online, get mortgages online, do payments and borrow and lend. So um, we were together at Bear Stearns uh, a couple decades ago, hard to believe. But even in the early 2000s, I had an ATM card. I could trade my stocks online. I could pay my bills online. What has really changed about fintech over the last 20 years? So if you look at fintech, it's really changing how we borrow and lend. It's changing how we do invoice finance and trade finance and real estate finance. It's actually changing so many ways that we do things. We're moving to a cashless society. So the way we transfer money abroad is different. And when we go abroad, we see people tapping their credit cards, not putting in the pin and chip, not printing a piece of paper. That's fintech. That's moving the way we spend our money, save our money and invest our money. Your background includes a stint as president of online lender Prosper Inc. and investing in a lot of the new and more disruptive uh, online lending platforms. Do you feel that Given the last 10 years, the credit environment we've had has been very benign. Credit quality has been generally very good. Have these companies been tested yet? So that's a great question. In the 2008, 2009, 2010 era, we saw the elimination of the HELOC, the home equity line of credit product. And that gave rise to the prospers and lending clubs and those groups that could now lend money to people who were now not able to access equity and liquidity in their home and had this high interest rate credit card debt that was 30 and 35 percent when you include all the fees and everything and so this peer-to-peer -peer lending and then marketplace lending and online lending industry really grew and took off and the banks did not make a move into the space and gave the fintechs a seven and eight year head start. And so cost of capital, which is really important for every single company, including fintech companies, was very high in the beginning as peer-to-peer -peer lending took off. But as institutions came in and securitization came in, cost of funding came down. So the answer to your question is there were a few tests. There was a test when the securitization market froze and spreads widened. And these online lenders couldn't securitize loans from their balance sheet. And then when the hedge funds came in, they wanted a better deal than the online lenders were used to. You're right. The big test hasn't come yet and it will come and you will see changes to credit. But it all comes down to who has the best pricing, credit, risk and underwriting, who has the lowest cost of capital and who has permanent capital and balance sheet capital to get through those tough times when many investors disappear and the securitization market's not available. Do you think also that the incumbent, many of the incumbents just have cost structures that, A, cost structures that don't enable them to broadly market small loans to lots and lots of individuals, and B, don't have, quite frankly, the ability to attract and retain technologists the way tech companies do? How are these banks 
position? Will they have to buy these companies or do you think they'll be able to kind of do it on their own? So I've met with the leadership teams of almost every single bank here and in Asia, in South America and in Europe. I literally just gave a presentation to the 10 CEOs of the 10 biggest banks in Europe and the regional banks all met in Atlanta where I gave a presentation about this. The banks and the incumbents have as much data as the fintechs. They have more engineers than the fintechs. They don't have the sense of urgency. They don't have what we call agility, right? Mm -hmm. And they don't have, I'll call the passion and creativity to do some of these newer things faster. Yes, they have more capital, lower cost of capital. They also have more regulation. So the fintechs were able to jump in here and get ahead of many of the incumbents. One big incumbent here in New York, very smart group, decided to create a fintech division and go in the lending business. And they've done a great job, but what they've learned is this is more expensive than they thought. This takes longer than they thought. And their pricing credit risk and underwriting models actually weren't that much better than some of the online lenders. Mm. And now their performance shows it. Mm. So my point is this looks easy like bridge and golf and many other things in life, but it's really quite challenging. And it's easy to talk about and harder to do. And well, let's, while you mention an online player and an incumbent here in New York, let's talk about the on deck JP Morgan deal that was announced about three years ago with a lot of fanfare, a lot of excitement. It was a great distribution partnership for on deck. It was heralded as a a way for JP Morgan to get into the small business lending world. That partnership just fell apart. Uh, I think a couple of weeks ago, what's behind that? What happened? What do you, what can you shed? Like, can you shed on that? That is the talk of the town. That is a really good question. So the partnership was a very good one. Partnerships don't last forever. Either they need to be iterated or improved upon. And here's a really good example. It was good while it was good. And then it isn't when it isn't. So JP Morgan benefited from that relationship as did on deck. And so what has to happen over time is things need to move to the next level. And they didn't, right? So JP Morgan decided to shut its bank fin, right? And they decided to exit some other things they were doing. In my opinion, and I don't have any information here to share, they're making space so they can make another big move into the fintech space. So that was a very calculated move to clear some space, to clear the decks, no pun intended, by shutting down the bank, ending that partnership, and a few other things they're ending to maybe make another bigger move in a more serious way into this business. So is one way to think about it that JP Morgan was experimenting and ran an experiment and maybe it worked well enough for them to say, we like this, but we don't want to do this with on deck. So we're going to do this in a different way, a bigger way, a better way going forward. They are definitely not going to not be in this business. They're just going to do it in a different way. You see many banks investing in the equity of some of the fintechs. You just saw Money Lion, a great fintech company, one of the neobank challenger banks here in New York, raise a big round at close to a billion dollars and two big banks invested in the equity of that round. You also see these banks buying the debt produced by these online lenders and some of the fintechs. Some do balance sheet loans, some do whole loan purchases, some do ABS securitization purchases from loans from these. So this is either the most exciting time for you as a incumbent or fintech or the scariest. Getting back to the credit cycle. So inevitably the credit cycle is going to turn. I have no idea when, but it will. What do you think happens to the fintechs at that point? So one of the things that happens when credit weakens is that investors either go away and stop buying or they ask for discounts to the loan to sell it below par or a discount to the servicing rate, the servicing strip, the 1% fee per year, for example, or they just stop buying or they look to sell their portfolios. So you're going to see the marketing teams hit the brakes because the investors will go away and not want to pay that rate for the loans that are coming through. So you've seen some of these fintechs grow too fast, take on too many borrowers from the wrong sources at too low of rates. And so the investors didn't get what they expected because the coupons were less or the losses were higher. So they stopped buying or sold these loans at a discount. And so my my prediction is, When credit turns, when some of these platforms are shown to be growing too fast and taking on the wrong borrowers at the wrong lower rate, 
you will absolutely see some of them not have the capital to fund the loans, hit the brakes on marketing, and really shrink their closed loan volume, their advertising, and their footprint. And if you're a bank, now banks run into trouble too when credit quality gets bad. So it's not like they come off scot-free. But if you're a bank, is is a reasonable strategy to say, hey, we're, we're only maybe two to four years out from next credit crisis in the country. We've gone for 10 years without one. Why don't we just wait? And then we'll be able to pick up all these companies super cheap. So the banks have to use the capital that's on their balance sheets. And that's why they are buying lots of the credit products, lots of the loans from these online lenders, marketplace lenders, and fintechs. It has been going very well for them, right? Their cost of capital is a half a basis point, 1%, 2% maybe at the top. And they're really able to buy these loans, consumer loans, auto loans, student loans, business loans, et cetera, from the online lenders and fintechs. As far as the equity goes, you're absolutely right. The banks saw these fintechs raise money at very high multiples. Sometimes they invested. A lot of times they didn't. You will start to see what I'm calling the tsunami hit. And that is where many of these incumbents, the telcos, the insurance companies, the banks, and other big groups, the insurance companies, own the equity, own some of these fintechs. You saw Allstate buy eSurance. This week, you saw Fox buy Credible, where I'm chairman of the board. Yeah, well, let's stop there for a second because now you're, you know, we're moving away from fintech, but now you're getting into a media fintech, right? Like Fox is not considered by most people to be a company involved in financial technology or financial services. And yet here we saw a major global media company buy and fintech, Credible Labs, which you are, uh, as you mentioned, affiliated with as chairman of the board. What's the industrial logic behind that deal? And are we going to see other media companies or, as you mentioned, telephone companies, et cetera, entering the space? And we've all, everyone's been waiting for Google and Amazon and Apple to do something big as well. Well, they are going to be doing something big and it will be coming out soon, whether it's Amazon lending or some of these other non-bank financial services that these platforms need to monetize the hearts and minds and wallets and eyeballs of all these people on their platform. The Fox example is a great one. Very smart group of business people running that company. They have all kinds of properties from Realtor.com to Monday Night Football to all the news stations and sports, etc. And by acquiring Credible, they're able to now introduce and monetize financial solutions, student loans, credit cards, personal loans, mortgages, and much more globally. And so you saw CNBC invest in Acorns also helping educate their viewers about investing and saving and things like that. So I think that this is the tip of the iceberg that we're going to see waves and waves of these big incumbents buying pieces of or all of fintech companies like you saw with Fox Incredible this week. When you think about successful fintechs, fintechs that you think are going to make it in the long term through the credit ups and downs, through recessions, through interest rate increases and decreases, et cetera. What are the qualities of, of these fintech companies? What are the qualities you see as most important in them? So I don't think a successful fintech company can be a one trick pony. Can't be one product where it rinses and repeats over and over and over again. Those are products. Those are not companies. So to build a real company, you need to have multiple solutions, capturing the life cycle of your customer, of your client. So in the lending business or in the neobank, challenger bank business, it can't just be a loan or a line of credit. It has to be ATM services, credit card services, trading services, saving, investing, travel, payroll services, and all of that. And so I think that's the lesson that these fintech companies can't just scale with one thing. They've got to do other things. And you're seeing that with the neobanks, with Chime well, that, and Moneyline. This quote-unquote rebundling of financial services into fintech companies seems to be the theme of the moment. But we've seen this before in the traditional banking world, right? Remember, you and I can go back to when Sandy Weil was cobbling together City into a quote-unquote financial supermarket, right? Institutional products, retail products, banking, investing, insurance, et cetera, all under one roof. Same thing now happening in fintech. Yes, 
I'll give you another example, a different way to think about that, that correct answer. Which, by the way, unwound and then goes through a cycles back where having everything again under one roof. So you and I are in our 50s, right? Our children are in their mid and late 20s. These children, this generation, even Gen X, Gen Y, and then this I generation, wants things differently. And they've shown us transportation, Uber and Lyft, lodging, Airbnb, music, Spotify, not iTunes, right? And over and over and over, we can go through examples of how they've shown us they want things in a different way. And what these neobanks have solved for is what does this I generation want? We watched our fathers put on suits and ties and go to the bank and ask for a loan and shake someone's hand. That's over. Our children don't go into the bank, but to get a roll of quarters, right? Or do something else. It's not for the coffee and cookies. That's for sure. And so what these neobanks and challenger banks have done is figured out how to get this next generation. And the banks are realizing that the children of their clients aren't coming there and they're going to have to figure this out. But they're giving the challenger banks, the Revoluts, the Money Lions, the Chimes, the Varos, the N26s from Asia and Europe a head start. And we're starting to see those European challenger banks come to the U.S. right now. It's going to be a fascinating time to see how many people they capture and how many dollars they capture and how many products they capture. And at what cost they do it. Correct. What's that customer acquisition cost, which seems to factor into fintechs? A hundred percent. And that's what I focus on back to your earlier question. How many products do they have? What's the lifetime value? What's the cost to acquire? What's the conversion rate and what's the cost of capital? Let's talk about public markets for a second. Stock twits being the largest social network for investors and traders here in the United States with over 2 million people. Most of the people we're talking to today, probably not experts in fintech, but they certainly are fascinated by, interested in, and love to comment upon stock markets. In the fintech area, several years ago, there was a lot of hoopla about IPOs of Lending Club, of On Deck, of Green Sky, of Elevate. Those four companies, and I don't mean to pick on them because they, they have their strengths and, and, and all that, but their stock prices have gotten hammered. Are there some commonalities there or is each one individual have its own issues that it's confronting? What, what went wrong with those stocks? So that's a great question, and everyone's talking about that this week, given one of them lost a third of their value in a day. So the reality is some of those companies can't figure out how to make money, generate EBITDA, stop losing money. No matter how fast they grow, no matter how big they are, how innovative they become, they're still losing money. So is that a momentum investor, a growth investor, a value investor? Who's investing in those stocks? They're losing favor and the CEOs are losing credibility with some of the analysts on Wall Street. The reality is all those companies might need to be private companies or part of bigger incumbents with lower cost of capital. So that's what people are trying to figure out is now what? What do we do about it? And do you think customer acquisition costs also plays into part of the problem there? Absolutely. A hundred percent. They still have not figured out how to get CAC, the cost of acquisition down to a level that works and bring up conversion and lower cost of capital. So if these companies can't figure out how to generate cash, there's going to be a problem when they need to raise more money for sure. And just to just for the audience, you know, when 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 I think about customer acquisition cost, I'm thinking about the actual financial cost to the company of acquiring a customer and getting them onto your platform to buy a product. So that that factors in your marketing and advertising expenses, your salespeople that you're paying a commission to potentially to bring someone on, the people designing your website, all of that factors in. And maybe sometimes even interest rates are subsidizing that a little bit, a lower rate to grow faster. You're just sort of borrowing from the future in that sense too. And you have to make sure, I think, is this a fair statement, Ron, that as an investor looking at these companies, that the value of that customer you're bringing on has to be higher than what you're paying to bring them on the platform. It does. And it doesn't change at scale. You're still losing money on everyone. If we look back, Bill, to the specialty finance era prior to the crisis, those companies were actually making money. But they were located in Kansas City and Dallas, Texas, not on Market Street in San Francisco and not on Sixth Avenue here in New York. So these businesses work. 
but you have to keep the cost low. Rent, people, and the cost of capital has to be less. It can work. There's just an issue today in the way they're set up, but that's going to change.